Hey everybody and welcome back to Unfiltered. I am your host Kaya McCullough and I am so excited to be bringing you another episode this week. You already know what we talk about on this podcast. It's the intersection of race, sport, pop culture, you know what it is through the the lens of my life experience, which is a very unique one. Um, So this week, I am super excited to bring on a guest to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart. He is one of my good friends, Andrew Cooper, and he's one of the only white men that I can have consistent conversations with without getting a headache. Um, And I would also argue he's probably enemy number one of the NCAA, which is a good thing because that is what we are talking about this week. Um, The NCAA, college athletes and their lack of rights, how we can ensure that they get those rights and, you know, how everyday people like you and me can help in the fight to ensure their rights. So I'm super excited for this episode. And if you are too, keep listening. Hello, hello. Welcome to my podcast. Hey, Kaya. It's great to see you again. I know. Long time no talk, just like I said. It's truly one of the greatest compliments I think a white man could receive is is to not give you a headache when speaking with you. So that's an honor. Thank you. (laughs) Most of the time you don't give me a headache. Sometimes you do, but most of the time you do not, which is, again, very much so a compliment. So thank you for recognizing that. And thank you for being the incredible person you are. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah. So why don't you introduce yourself to people who don't know who you are? Yeah, of course. So my name's Andrew Cooper. Um, I'm a master's student at Berkeley right now, studying the intersection of sports, society, and education, more specifically on the systemic injustices, inequities, um, and solutions for college sports and college athlete rights. Um, as it pertains to amateurism and uh, abolishing it and dismantling the NCAA. So I'm really all about dismantling the NCAA. Like you said, public enemy number one of the NCAA. I helped um, advise and organize the We Are United movement in the Pac-12 in the summer of 2020, where about 450 football players in the Pac-12 threatened to sit out of the season unless certain health and safety protections were met, um, educational protections and economic rights, including revenue sharing, um, which stirred a lot of pots, um, particularly on the institution's behalf. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, grew up uh, running track and cross country, ran track and cross country at Washington State University and Cal, where I served as the president of the Student Athlete Advisory Committee at both schools, which is essentially the um, official voice of college athletes in the NCAA, but doesn't really do that much. um, And I'm sure we'll get into that. So that's a a bit of, that's my, that's my introduction. That's what I'm about. So basically you just know what the fuck you're talking about is what I'm gathering. Oh, we swear on this show. Sweet. You're allowed to, it's unfiltered. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I, (laughs) I am probably not as educationally or academically um, expert as others in the field, but, you know, I think along with my experience being a SAC president at two Pac-12 institutions, trying to advocate for meaningful reform through the avenue that currently exists in the institution and realizing and learning that it sucks and doesn't do anything and is designed to fail, is designed to oppress us. Um, I think that experience combined with actually being a college athlete um, and experiencing the, you know, exploitation and oppression of it, even as a subpar cross-country runner, um, it's still an incredibly demanding activity for all of us, all college athletes. And I missed out on plenty economic opportunities even as a subpar cross country runner. So (laughs) I feel because of my personal experience um, combined with my, you know, it's kind of as I went through the process as an advocate um, in that journey, I was also studying these issues at the same time while experiencing them. And so I I have a really unique lens on the issue and am very confident in my stances on these matters because, um, because of my experiences and, you know, my studies, you know, it's a, very unique 
field of study. <laughs> it's very specific. Well, you are the perfect person for this episode, um, which is why I picked you. So I am now going to do the part of the show where I tell a little intro story about the person um, to familiarize the audience with them through my perspective. Um, <laughs> and though, you know, we haven't been friends for too long, I feel like we talk all the time. And the thing that stood out in my mind when I was thinking about um, something to share with the audience was <laughs> like the other week when we were working on that PowerPoint that we were doing, like our stack or whatever you call it. And we were, <laughs> we were on the phone for like over two hours and we were just both, I think, at the end of our rope in terms of like working on that PowerPoint and... <laughs> Like I just I was getting so nippy and like you were handling it with such grace like I was definitely getting hangry and annoyed and frustrated because we were going back and forth on like the like the littlest semantics about like each slide and just the way that you handled that I was like okay like this is somebody I can keep in my life because most people can't handle me when I when I get in that little mood. Um, and I think it just kind of exemplified like your absolute unlimitless, like unlimited optimism in everything that we're doing, which is just such like a draining topic. Um, like talking about, you know, how disenfranchised athletes are is actually really draining, especially in the context of like March Madness right now and everything that we've seen in the past year with COVID. So that's when I was like, oh, okay, this guy's really in it for the long haul. And <laughs> I knew our friendship was pretty solidified in that moment. And we ended up, you know, finishing the PowerPoint today. So it ended up not even being that big of an issue, the things that I was upset about. But yeah, that's my little <laughs> intro story. I love that story because it's, um, I'm just so grateful that you take the time and energy that you do to make sure that this is good. And I know how busy you are, how committed you are, how passionate you are. And so for you to show up, I know in and of itself already takes a ton of energy, but then it's also, I think this kind of goes into, you know, privilege and why I feel so passionate about using my privilege as a white male um, to have that unlimited optimism is because I don't experience the oppression in the same way that the black women would. And so when you're talking about race or, you know, the exploitation of predominantly black athletes being a black athlete, like it's, I'm sure triggering and brings up trauma and is more like it brings up trauma for me and I'm white. So like, I, I couldn't <laughs> even imagine, you know, the fatigue um, that it brings up for, and that's something I always thought with, um, you know, last summer when after George Floyd was executed was like, I think a lot of white people were exhausted by the conversations we were having for the first time in our lives for many of us. And I just always thought of like, oh, so this is maybe a fraction or, you know, a grain of sand compared to what black people experience on a daily basis. So like, I should shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> and it's in this, in this work that we're doing, you know, and why, so grateful that you're doing it with me like it's one thing to post about you know things that are wrong uh, particularly in these institutions and as it pertains to racial justice but it's another to do the actual work that you know either amplifies black stories empowers black communities or in our case um uh you know trying to obtain economic freedom and economic opportunities for black communities, um, specifically predominantly black football and basketball players. And so um, having experienced, you know, burnout in the past and, and being really in tune with my purpose and why we're doing this um, and my passion just for serving this community that inspires me so much, you know, your story is so inspiring to me. And um, it's not the hardest thing in the world for me to have this kind of optimism. Yeah. And I think you're also you're also experiencing the tail end of two years of working on this, <laughs> essentially, you know, yeah. messing up here and there. And now I'm like, this is it. We got it right in front of us. So I'm like you, you, you tell me because I'm like, we're going to get you 
an apartment soon. I'm like, <laughs> you're like, man, you're super optimistic about this. And I'm like, I just have confidence that we're going to get this victory in this dub um, because I've been doing this for two years and nothing has been even remotely as energetic or close to what we're doing right now. So uh, I'm great. That story is funny because I'm a little context for people. I'm very like visionary, floaty, esoteric kind of person type B, as you like to say. And, and Kai is very organized, grounded, specific, like clear, clean person. And so um, when we agree, uh, I think it's good. It's good when we agree because it means that it, the final product is good and that's ultimately <laughs> what matters. So I'm grateful for you and that you take the time and energy to do the work on this and um, particularly with how exhausting it is and how overwhelming your schedule is. Yeah. So I'm going to, you know, you know, I don't really like affection. So no more sappy shit um, in this episode. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate you. Gratitude, but... Kaya. Gratitude. <laughs> no more of that. Um, okay, so the first topic that we're gonna we're gonna we're just gonna start from the base. I'm just gonna assume not a lot of people know, you know, what issues college athletes are facing, or just assume that most people are just on the very surface level understanding, like I was um not too long ago. So what do you think are some of the most important rights that are currently being excluded from college athletes um let's just start there <laughs> let's just start there well I, i'd like to actually start somewhere a little more fundamental um and the okay. first question that i was asked when i arrived on campus at berkeley with my professor the first question he asked me was what do you think is the biggest issue facing college athletes and you know i i thought wow that's a really big question let me think about that for a minute and you know, he said, you've already been admitted. This isn't an interview. <laughs> and then I responded, mental health. And I still strongly believe that this is the biggest issue facing college athletes is mental health for two reasons. First, because amateurism has create, has stripped college athletes of fundamental economic rights. In turn, the institutions do not abide by any regulations or rules that any other business follows. And and it's created this environment that is completely void of any oversight or accountability. And as money has poured into the system, so too has the pressure that coaches experience and in turn impose upon college athletes to succeed. And because of that, because you're a full-time student, you're competing at one of the highest levels you know, in the world, in your sport, uh, and you're just trying to like live, <laughs> Um, it gets really overwhelming, and I think is, you know, the uh, having been at Washington State University when Tyler Holinsky, our quarterback, died by suicide, um, and, and really being in that community when our, we just had this outpour of love and support and conversations about mental health. Um, I, I'm strongly of the belief that mental health is the biggest issue facing college athletes because there are so many suicides and deaths um not just from football players but from all athletes and football players yeah. are obviously the ones that get reported about um but i don't even know in the pac-12 during the time i was an athlete how many athletes died by suicide but i i'm pretty certain it's in the double digits um which yeah. which is horrifying that it's that high um and it's an issue it's an issue by the way that is sweeping or, uh all college students um, but you know, the demands of being an athlete are a little more pressing. Uh, so, so to start there with mental health, I think that's the most pressing matter that we all experience. Um, and it's why, you know, I'm wearing this three, uh, for, you know, Tyler and his family and Holinsky's hope, which is yeah. the foundation they started. That's incredible. Um, but the going into that, so amateurism is the principle that the NCAA invented quite frankly, um, to divest college athletes of fundamental economic rights. And, you know, the first NCAA president, Walter Byers, actually set, wrote in his memoir, quote unquote, we crafted the term student athlete. That's why you won't hear me say it beyond quotes. We crafted the term student athlete to avoid paying workers' compensation. Um, and the result of that was this, like, 
pseudo legal classification of college athletes as non employees, but also something that didn't exist. And all the labor law that exists and protects um, employees not only allows them to get paid, but like literally allows you to have a safe work environment just doesn't exist for college athletes. Um, and I think what's most, it's important to understand the context and the history because of amateurism, the NCAA um, doesn't pay taxes as a 501c3 nonprofit that claims to be an educational opportunity, which I think any athlete could attest that you only sacrifice elements of your education for your sport not yeah. the other way around it's it, it, this notion that you get a better education because of your sport is such a lie uh, i don't think a lot of athletes know that that's like the lie the ncaa is built upon and why they don't pay taxes on a billion in revenue and so the fuel for their machine the fear on their behalf their motivation in my opinion, is to is the fear of paying taxes, not the actual fear of paying athletes. It's the fear of paying taxes on the billion in revenue that they generate. And so that's why they're in Congress trying to, you know, advocate for an antitrust exemption in the Supreme Court, which, you know, the, those hearings were today. Um, but from a economic standpoint, you know, when we look on the field and we're watching football, men's basketball, women's basketball, the athletes are overwhelmingly black, plain yeah. and simple. Um, you know, average across the NCAA in those sports is 60%, uh, which feels a little low. And I think if you looked at like that's all the programs in, you know, who starts and who's actually competing, it's, it's overwhelmingly black. And so yeah. when you look at the fact that the labor force is predominantly black, being divested of fundamental economic rights so that the white man or these white institutions don't pay taxes, have these balloon salaries. You know, the top 16 executives in the NCAA, you know, who uh, report their income on their 990 tax return to the IRS, average, average 850000 in uh, income. And so it's... You could be very low on the total pull at the NCAA and be making a ton of money, more than university presidents make. Like it's it's staggering um, how much money is being put in these pockets, stuffed in these pockets. You know, the NCAA from 2016 to 2018 spent spent 100 million on lawyers denying college athletes fundamental economic rights, um, fighting to uphold amateurism. And I think athletes, you know, what we don't think about much is just the fact that there are two sides to this coin. You know, there's one side that's the in interests of the institution and one side that's the interests of the athletes. And because every four years there's a brand new labor force, we're super overworked, isolated from one another on campus. You know, we're just not friends with each other. We don't talk to, we definitely don't talk to athletes from other teams at other schools. Um, these are all things that the NCAA has benefited from in perpetuating these injustices. And it's, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's just important for us to first frame, you know, have the educational context of amateurism, the term student athlete, you know, which I am on a quest to <laughs> abolish and just get rid of entirely. Like it drives me crazy. Anytime I hear someone say that word, um, yeah. And people know that, you know, that I, I hear people all the time who are close with me, you know, catch themselves saying it. And it, you'll hear if you actually listen to the NCAA or any institution, it gets a little intense how much they actually say that word. And it's kind of yeah. like half their job is just saying that as much as possible. So I think the framing of the racial injustice of amateurism is the most important issue. Um, as it pertains to college athlete rights is just, it's just how we view um, the issue. Okay. So now that we have kind of the baseline about, you know, the kind of rights and the kind of injustices that college athletes are facing, um, you know, there are certain proposed kind of solutions for that. 
um, one being revenue sharing, one being NIL. So in super layman's terms, like, can you explain those for people listening who may not know what that is? Yeah. So we all, people always talk about, oh, college athletes can't, be, can't get paid or they'd be pay for play or they'd be professionals. When we're talking about economic rights, it's important that we recognize sort of the hierarchy um, of these rights and what is most easily obtainable um, and then what is like the furthest in the in the distance, you know, what full economic rights means. And so <clears throat> fundam- foundationally, first step is restricted name, image, and likeness rights. And so name, image, and likeness rights, that's what everyone, every right that every adult American has in this country, um, you know, to sell or license, you know, their image, their name, their likeness um, at this, you know, that's, that's a right that literally everyone has. So if, if you're, you know, uh, a homeless person and Steven Spielberg walks by you on the street and is just like, hey, I like how you're homeless. Do you want to be in my movie? You know, of course, the homeless guy could say yes and then sign a contract that, you know, would give the broadcast studio uh, rights to his NIL, his name, image, and likeness, and then compensate him for that. But that same right is stripped of college athletes when they come on campus. You sign it away. Um, yeah, you do. <laughs> so it's you sign away that right um, for amateurism, as we were talking about, and it's it's not a benefit. Like that's just something students have that right. Um, and so restricted NIL rights is what the NCAA is currently proposing or has for the last two years or so and still hasn't passed it. Um, restricted NIL would mean that schools, conferences, the NCAA, if they don't like a deal that an athlete takes, they could strike it down. They could just say, no, we don't want you to have that deal. And then, you know, within the bounds of their rules, just say, yeah, don't. You know, like <laughs> and the same thing happens with transferring. Like any school can block any transfer still to this day. Um, before the transfer portal, you know, when I needed to transfer as a grad student, I'd ask for permission to contact to transfer, but now fortunately yeah. you don't do that anymore. You don't have to have that weird conversation with your coach. You can just, um, you know, enter the transfer portal, um, which is good, but uh, you know, that's a different, that's a different conversation, but <laughs> first is restricted NIL next is just full NIL rights. And so what really comes with full NIL rights is this two things. The schools can't um, block or restrict any, deals that you take um, because there's no rules for them. You know, uh, people often say, well, what about liquor and gambling? Well, schools have liquor and gambling deals. Yeah. Um, a lot of schools have liquor deals. Uh, University of Colorado Boulder just signed the first gambling contract um, as an athletic department. So if there's no rules restricting the institutions, those there shouldn't be rules restricting the athletes. Now, of course, like, you know, people can negotiate those into their individual terms, but there shouldn't be just a rule that enables institutions to just strike down deals, you know, yeah. without consent. Um, and so full NIL would be you could sign any deal that you want. And it would also mean that you could collectively group your NIL and group license it, which is how Madden would have to be made. Um, you know, or EA college football is what they're calling it. Uh, That's the only way that that could happen is if there was an entity, a players association uh, that collectively negotiated those group license deals on behalf of the college athletes. And, you know, there's group license deals in the NFL, NBA for, you know, Beats or Bose or Coca-Cola. Like there's a lot of different, um, you know, uh, licenses that can be granted. Uh, But right now, you know, so that would be the next step. Then above that is revenue sharing of any form. Um, and so what that would mean is that a percentage of either the revenue generated by the institution or the conference or the NCAA would be equally distributed to athletes of that sport or athletes of that university, depending on how it's negotiated. Um, currently, college sports exist under a revenue sharing model for the institution. So if you make it to the NCAA tournament, um, each game that you play in the tournament gives you 
a certain amount of units, they call it. And each unit is worth something like, is worth millions of dollars. And so the further you go into the tournament, the more millions that your school makes from <laughs> like in direct, you know, cash payment to that university. And there's only 15 guys on a team. It could easily, you know, half of the revenue distributed to the school for March Madness could easily be distributed amongst players on that team who were responsible for it in football. Um, so it's important to understand the economic model of college sports. The NCAA makes no money off of football. They make all their money off basketball. And schools and conferences don't really make that much money off of, fo- off of basketball. They make all their money off of football. And so the way that you can really see this in action is if you watch a college football game, they only ever wear their conference logo on their jersey. And if they're at the college football playoffs, which is its own organization, um, then they also wear the CFP logo. But in March Madness, the athletes wear an NCAA logo. And so it's an interesting distinction, like how the money is literally being negotiated or sold. Um, But in college football specifically, so um, the Pac-12 is a mid-tier Power 5 school in terms of revenue or institution. They pulled in $540 million in the last revenue cycle. Um, The Big Ten is the richest. They pulled in $800 million um, in a year. Um, And the poorest school in the Big Ten was Rutgers with $100 million in revenue. That's the poorest school in the Big Ten. Um, so the PAC 12 specifically, I'll use this because this is what we United was advocating for. So the PAC 12, 540 million of that, they say, okay, here's this pool of money that we're going to equally distribute amongst the 12 schools. And it turned out in that cycle that they made 540 million. They gave each school $32 million just for being in the PAC 12, for being a part of, you know, the television rights deal that they have mostly for football it's like 90 95 percent for football and we were saying well half of that money that you're giving our school because of the money that football players are making um so 16 million dollars that should be equally distributed amongst all the football players on the team and we said 50 50 or started with that because that's how call it that's how professional sports operate and the deal is very simple in professional sports Look, we play the games, we put on the product on the court as players, and you sell, you know, you negotiate and sell and put on the games on our behalf. So you guys get half and we get half. Yeah. A fair, you know, deal (laughs) agreed upon by both parties. It seems like it. It should be. It's working very well for the NBA. Um, The NFL is a little more lopsided towards the owners. Um, but in the NBA, both parties are making tremendous money. You know, the NFL is highly lucrative and that's, so that's revenue sharing, but that, how that looks in action, like it shouldn't only be football and basketball players making money off of this. Like it, you know, very well, having been to the final four for soccer, there's a little more than $0 being made of that. Yeah, right? there are sponsorships everywhere. Like, so I, I got, I'm lucky enough. I got to watch you play in the final four. And when I went, you know, they had, they're called sponsorship activation. So it's when a corporation spends money and gives the NCAA money. So that their logo is on the, on the pitch yeah, or on the somewhere. And I don't know if you remember this, but before your game started, they bring out all these little girls um no, to like you know remember. announce the game with you guys or, or do something you guys might not even be on the field yet but they bring out all these little girls you know to start the match and they're all wearing degree deodorant t-shirts that's a sponsorship activation i mean it's a little yeah. weird that they're using little children but like the, <laughs> they're at your game right the game there's nothing happening without your game there's yeah music. i mean i just notice all these things so this notion that there's revenue generating sports and non-revenue generating sports is false also yeah. of course football and basketball makes hundreds of millions of dollars but um you know other olympic sports do make money and so that's the term i use is olympic sports and then employment and so employment is the highest form of compensation of economic protections and rights that you can have and 
that would look like being able to negotiate employment terms with your university or your conference. Um, and the way I, the model I think that makes the most sense is power five football and basketball for both men and women um, breaking away from amateurism and having those athletes be employed because those three sports are by far the most lucrative. Um, yeah. And as time goes, I do think that women's softball, women's soccer, and women's volleyball will enter that realm as well as those sports grow. Um, but those, those are the tiers of economic rights that you can have as a college, just as a person, but that are most relevant to college sport. Yeah, no, there, there literally is such levels to it. And it's crazy that, you know, we haven't even had the opportunity to get um, restricted NIL yet, just because the NCAA is so slack, a slack, a daisical on it. They, they literally, you know, what, what did you say earlier today? They uh, said that they were going to change it like, last year or something and then they they still haven't so sb 206 which was the bill signed in california yes. by gavin newsom which made it illegal to restrict your nil in the state of california beginning 2023 29 days after that bill was signed um the ncaa put out a press release saying the division one board unanimously votes to permit college athletes to benefit from their name, image, and likeness within the collegiate model. And every news outlet, and this was October 29th, 2019, mm -hmm. 519 days ago from today, March 31st. And the reason they did that is because every media outlet in the country CNN, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, they all posted the same headline. NCAA allows college athletes to make money off NIL or NCAA allows athletes to get paid. And we haven't because if you look at the fine print, you know, within the collegiate model, what does that mean? Within amateurism. Oh, well, what's amateurism? It means they can't get paid. Yeah. Circular so argument. <laughs> it, it's, it's important for us to ask, like, why are they being lackadaisical? Why have they spent $100 million to prevent us from having fundamental NIL rights when that doesn't cost them anything? And it's because over the last 10 years, the line has slowly inched closer to employment and further away from amateurism. And with NIL, it, make, it gets a lot closer to employment. And yeah. the closer you get to employment, the closer the NCAA gets to um paying taxes and so <laughs> frankly like they are working very hard all their money if you talk to any compliance officer in the country right now they will tell you we have no idea how nil is going to be implemented nothing is being told to them they have no yeah. idea what's happening it's because the ncaa is not spending time and money and resources figuring it out making it work they're spending time and money $100 million over the last two years, specifically, fighting um, to ensure that the courts, the Supreme Court right now, and Congress soon deny us these economic rights. And so it really is the line in the sand of you either stand on the side of the institution and want to protect amateurism, you continue denying college athletes fundamental economic rights, or you stand with the athletes, the players, and, and you know, how we make it work, whether it's full NIL, revenue sharing, employment, like where that line is drawn, we yeah. can figure that out. But like, we have to start the conversation with our interests are different because we've always been taught to believe that the schools have our best interests at heart. And <laughs> when push comes to shove, you know, in, in the worst situations, they show that they don't, you know, they always protect their best interests over the interests of the athletes and a lot of athletes have gotten screwed over because of it and a lot have also died um, yeah. which really the sad I mean, in my opinion it it just goes to show i mean across the board i mean we're seeing this reflected in a lot of american society but i mean with this specifically like institutions really just don't have people's best interests in mind i mean and we can circle this back to capitalism we could circle this back to white supremacy. I mean, this literally could be a five hour conversation. Um, it's made motto. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, like as you're pointing out very poignantly, like 
institutions do not have college athletes best interest in mind which I think is really telling um and I guess that kind of segues me on to my my next question is like how do these sort these sorts of of issues that college athletes are facing how do those tie into like issues like gender inequity um racial injustice and how would things like revenue sharing and slash or nil how would those help remedy those broader issues in the context of college sports yeah that's a great question and it's important for us to remember that college sports exist within society right and it's it's crazy you know studying this how it's really at the epicenter of all these ideological and political clashes between gender race class education um with gender you have some of the most incredible and ar arguably the most popular sports league in the country as it pertains to what women's soccer, women's softball, women's basketball is definitely more popular than the WNBA. You know, the most watched women's basketball game had three and a half million viewers, which is similar to the Masters and the um, U.S. For Open. College. college women's basketball. Yeah, right? college women's basketball. Sorry if I misspoke. College women's basketball final game three and a half million viewers the wnba's most viewed event was seven hundred sixty thousand in 2018 and, right in 2018 and that's so this is a popular product that we create and we do that with you know in partnership with um you know our schools and their jerseys but ultimately there's no product without us playing and people watch sports because they like competition and they want good games. You don't watch a game. You don't care about UCLA soccer. If UCLA soccer is always putting up 20 goals and shutting yeah. everyone out. It's not fun to watch games like that. You know, you want close games. You want overtime. Um, so on the women's side, you have women playing softball, soccer, basketball, volleyball, who are incredible athletes. And they're playing at the highest level in this country. You know, in women's basketball and soccer, there is a league. There is literally a professional league where you don't get paid very much. And that's its own separate issue. But in college, you get paid nothing. Yeah. And it's and in softball and volleyball, it is the highest level of play in the country. So with women, you are stripping them of the opportunity to capitalize on your athletic talents, your athletic, you know, your physical labor, the sacrifices you've made. Um and they do it in an environment where you're not safe either, you know, where you have no health and safety protections. Nothing is mandated on that front, um, you know, because of lack of oversight, sexual harassment and rape is rampant in college sports. Um, and so from a financial standpoint, you know, the way to empower people is to give them money, right? Like, I think everyone would do a little bit better, like, they were making more money, life would probably yeah. be better. Um, so for women, it's it's wrong in that regard. Um, for black athletes and black women, specifically in basketball, you know, women's basketball, um, it's the most amplified. Um, and that, I just say that sport because that's where it's, you know, majority black. Uh, and, but for black athletes, I mean, this goes into the racial wealth gap between black and white communities, um, which are still the ramifications and impl implications of slavery is still being felt today. And you have, like, let's say the model is uh, predominantly black football and basketball players make the revenue so that white Olympic athletes like cross country runners can have our sports. Is that even a model that we want? Like, is that ethical? We're the minority, you know, you have 60% black revenue generate like high revenue generating athletes who are overrepresented on their campus across the country those same black students represent four percent of their campuses so when you have four percent of students are black and then 60 percent of the students who make money are black it's it is you know the the quote i love the most from taylor branch is um you catch a whiff of the plantation um, and I, I think that's telling because it's not, of course, it's not as gruesome as slavery, 
though it is grueling physical labor, people die and you're being divested of fundamental economic rights. And it's predominantly black labor to fill predominantly white pockets. And so from a racial <laughs> standpoint, I know, sorry, it's a lot. It's no, it, I mean, but it's shitty, the truth. Shitty when you like, oh, this product I love, I love college sports and, and I love the athletes. That's why I'm so passionate about this. But when you strip it of, you know, all the beauty and tradition that we love, like, and you see what we as college athletes feel and experience, it's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> and being a college athlete is not as glamorous as it seems. Like it is a grind. You are waking up at five or 6 a.m. every day. You every day. And by the way, now that I'm not an athlete, I have no idea how I manage this kind of physical <laughs> schedule. Like working out, you're working out for four hours a day, yeah. every day. And and that's probably two workouts also. So you have shower twice and then you have classes all day. So the I have no idea how I survived or how I graduated, um, honestly, doing that because it's a Herculean task to balance both. And it's not, it's much more overwhelming um, for athletes than it is the product you see when you tune into a game. Like that seems yeah. fun. That's like, the moment of joy and fun that they have, but 99% of it is not. And it's, you know, suffering in darkness, whether that's training alone or, you know, literally being alone uh, and suffering with your mental health. And so from, from a women, from a gender standpoint, gender equity standpoint, um, it's a ensuring these sports don't get cut if college athletes get paid. Um, but it's also, look, you guys are the best athletes in your field um at this level and you put on a product that people watch and tune into um and you're being barred fundamental economic rights and then on the racial justice standpoint i mean it's it's just simply a ton of money that is being you know stolen from black communities and put into white pockets and so that's that's the gender and racial disparity yeah that I mean, as you were talking, it was reminding me a lot of the book that my book club read, um, $40 Million Slaves by William C. Roden. If anybody listening hasn't read that, please read it because it is one of the best books I've ever read. Um, but he talked a lot about the conveyor belt that essentially, you know, strips these predominantly black communities of, you know, this talent, they, t they take black people out of their communities, displace them, and then bring them into institutions where they are then exploited for their labor um, to benefit institutions like the NCAA, like the universities. And, you know, I think a lot of what people don't understand is that advocating for college athletes and their rights is a racial injustice issue. Like this is an issue that affects black communities across the nation and it has for a long long time um throughout the history of sport so i mean i just i think it's still it's so interesting that in you know the reckoning that has happened in 2020 um with obviously like you said the execution of george floyd and just all of the protests that have happened this summer um and as people are beginning to discuss you know what justice in things of, of racism look like um, the conversation about college athletes is like still so quiet. And so, I mean, I'm glad that it's getting a lot more attention um, with, you know, the thing that the men's basketball teams did in March madness. And I'm glad that it's getting more attention, but I feel personally like there needs to be a lot more, honestly, just because it is, it, it will have such a big impact on these communities. Um, would it's, you agree? It's so, it's so important. Yeah. <laughs> for us as athletes, especially to start viewing this from the lens of race as yeah. a racial injustice, because what was so inspiring to me in the summer was how many college athletes took more than an athlete and embraced it and put it into action and stood. They led protests. They led marches. You know, yeah. they spoke out against police brutality. They which is, by the way, for college athletes to speak out is very difficult. Um, yeah. And so for athletes to take, have the strength and courage to speak out against these issues, um, 
it was monumental and inspiring, you know, especially with Kylan Hill and the work he did, you know, getting the Confederate flag off of the Mississippi state flag. But what he did that a lot of us don't realize is he used his ultimate power um, to demand that be changed. And what's his ultimate power? His labor. Labor. Whether he's a game. You know, he <laughs> said, I'm not going to suit up. I won't play. Yeah. One person, this is not, the team could still put a running back into the game and play. But one person has enough power with their labor to change the state flag. And the that's a symbolic victory. And like real progress is money being put into black communities. And I think it's hard for college athletes to remove themselves from the situation and see the bigger picture of like, we're black. Like, obviously not me, but like the majority <laughs> of the basketball players, you know, saying like, we're black. This is our community that we could be giving back to. You know, so right now, so many guys, I hear this all the time, are taking money from their stipend, which is like, you know, maybe they have a couple hundred bucks left over after paying rent and food. Yeah. Um, and they're sending it back to their family because the situations are so dire and so desperate for our communities. But it also means that they have the most to lose by speaking out. Yeah. Um, so I think as we as college athletes start to see the bigger picture of amateurism as a racial injustice, um, I think more will be willing to stand in unity with each other to um, dismantle it, honestly, or not. I mean, dismantle amateurism. Amateurism needs to be abolished, plain and simple. That's like, our new hashtag. Abolish, abolish amateurism. amateurism. I, it might be too aggressive, but <laughs> we should definitely say it with each other. It might be too aggressive because okay. uh, the quote that um, Amanda Gorman shared that Nancy Pelosi told her, I mean, Amanda Gorman, I, I just love, she's amazing. Um, the quote that she said was, come in with a feather even if you need to eventually use a hammer. I was like, Ooh, okay, I like so that. So we just That's... need to be low-key so we... first. We're starting low-key. We're starting low-key. Like, <laughs> look, internally, we know what it's about, right? Yeah. Um, and right now, me and Kai are, like, implicitly discussing the work we're working on right now, you know? And uh, the it's, it's important, I think, to come in initially with, like, hey, this is welcoming. This is not going to be scary. Um, we have full control over what we're doing because if you start at the most, you know, if you start at We Are United, if you start at 50-50 revenue sharing, a lot of people are just yeah. kind of forced to make a decision on the spot if they support it or not, and they never have the conversation. And it's, you know, when people with big egos have, say no, it's hard for them to change that decision later on. And so what we're working on is, you know, a solution for all college athletes, but ultimately like with the intent and purpose of abolishing amateurism, um, which how do we know amateurism is abolished? You can put money in your pocket <laughs> from being an athlete. It's not that complicated. Yeah. Like you just need, to be, you just need to be able to make money um, that is rightly yours. That is currently being stolen from you. And yeah, I, I really don't think that people understand like, how much you sacrifice being a college athlete like even just reflecting on my own experience like you're coming out of high school like you don't know any of this stuff and so you're essentially like signing away your rights and then you know then you're told you can't do this you can't do this you can't do this there was instances where like i had to get approved to like do interviews because you know i wasn't allowed to your first amendment right yeah like athletes are legitimately like stripped of some pretty fundamental things. And like you said, when you said at the beginning, um, NIL is like every American has that. And I was like, huh, they do, don't they? And I think part of the problem is that we're kind of indoctrinated by our, our universities and by our institution um, or by the NCAA that like, you can't, not only do you not have those rights, but you can't ask for them because, you know, you're being given so much and, you know, you're getting your education and a lot of people like aren't even having their education play, uh, paid for. So it's just, it's such a, it's such a, a toxic, like self-perpetuating system that I don't think people realize is as bad as it is. And that's why I get so frustrated seeing like 
these old ass white dudes on Twitter who are like, well, they should just be grateful for, you know, having the opportunity to be pulled out of whatever. I'm like, can you can you shut up? Like you you literally have no idea what you're talking about. And so that's why I'm glad that people like you are doing this work because it is so important in, you know, fixing some of these inequities, gender inequities, racial inequities, um, just, you know, some of these things that are just stripping athletes of fundamental rights. <laughs> I'm so frustrated now. <laughs> We come in as freshmen and like, we're just passionate about our game. And like, yeah. we all want to become Olympians. We want to become professional athletes. And you have to, by the way, people don't realize this, but you have to believe in that to even make it to this level. Like yeah. no one is making it D1. Like, yeah, I'm all right. Like, it's okay. Like you, you are the best. You're a state champion where you're from. You have everyone around you telling you, you can do this. And you come in as a freshman and you're really, you have no idea what you're answering. And your sophomore year, you kind of start to figure out how to do your sport a little bit. Your junior year, maybe you get injured or like you maybe get in the groove of your sport um, or you're just figuring out life. And maybe the reality that you aren't going to be a professional athlete starts to set in a little bit and you have a life outside of sport. Um, but by the time you're a senior, you're just focused on graduating and then you're gone and you have no idea what, what just happened to you. It's just punch 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 left and right left and right <laughs> and because that punt that cycle by the way is literally wake up at five grind all day until 10 or 11 o'clock at night you probably don't even finish all your homework barely eat i can't even the food yeah the food is a we don't get fed enough episode. we don't get oh, enough food honestly like that podcast. needs to be a, such a push for food but we Polar are episode. And that's every single day. It just repeats itself and it just flies by. And then when it's over, like I felt, I found myself like unpacking trauma from that. I think came from just being an athlete. Um, that's I'm a walk on, like I'm always a walk on to be clear. And it's everyone's training at the same level, the same capacity, making the same sacrifices. Um, but when people like Billy Joel out here saying like just be grateful that's what you're told nonstop by everyone coaches administrators if you complain about anything hey i don't think we're getting enough food <laughs> just be grateful that's the response oh we would kill to do what you do and so you're you're guilted into feeling bad for like suffering or struggling and then when you're done or let's say you're actually like good and you want money and then you have billy joel out here saying well i'd play that game you know, for free. If I was you, like, I would love to. It's like, you're not good enough, dude. Like, <laughs> let's straight, straight up. up. You're not good enough. Not everyone can wear a UCLA soccer jersey. I Ask any high school women's soccer player if they can make it, if they can be good enough to join UCLA's women's soccer team. And very, very less, it's what, point zero 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 one for your case specifically, for mine, just being in a Power 5 program, like a top 25 program, I think it's 0.0001% of distance runners make it to that level. You going to the Final Four, it's there's only, what, five, ten teams in the country maybe at the pedigree of UCLA? Like, it's, I mean. <laughs> well, UCLA's been to the Final Four. I mean, you can hype it up a little bit. Like, how many I times have you guys gone? I, I went twice, went and lost twice. So Kaya went twice. So like that means the team was so good and you played too. Like the team is so good and Kaya is so good. Four year starter. Just four year starter. Drop How many really people quick. Like, 10 people on the pitch? <laughs> 11. 11 people on the pitch. Well, there are a lot of people that play soccer in this country. It is so difficult to get to that level. People don't realize the level of competition it is. And as athletes, here's what we got to honestly start realizing. Fuck those people. <laughs> no, for real. The only thing that matters is whether is what, how we feel about it, how we feel about each other, how united we are as yeah. athletes, first and foremost. And whether we're willing, this was this was pretty game changing for we are united and the football players. Look, the only people that have a say in this decision are Pac-12 football players who play football because you, you no one else puts on the pads. The yeah. coach who gets paid a lot of money, they don't make the game-winning throw. They don't make the game-winning kick. They don't play. They are the closest to victory, and that's why they get paid the most. 
but they ultimately don't make the decision. Am I going to put on pads today? Yes or no. And so for us as athletes, that's what we need to start realizing is like our true power lies in whether we play or not. And whether we leverage that power is one thing, you know, like, but as long we should at least start to recognize that when we play our sport, that's labor. Um, we choose whether we use that labor or not. And look, all you have to do to realize that your labor is think about how hard it is and recognize that you're a walking billboard for Nike or Adidas or Under Armour every single day. And yeah. most of the time we do it unconsciously because like, that's just the gear we get and we want to wear it. Don't get me wrong. I We're not allowed gear. to wear anything else. But when you, travel, to be seen in when it. you travel, if you tried to show up in not Nike gear when you travel, yeah. you get barked at. <laughs> That is not going to fly. They would tell you, the coach would tell you, you're not, we're not leaving until you change. Cause this yeah. is big. Um, gosh, you're, you're bringing, you're bringing up a lot of trauma for me. That I didn't even know I had, um, it's there's tough. just so much, I know there. And it's just pointing out to me, like that there is just so much work to do. And so I guess my next question, starting to wrap it up, um, what kind of support will it require, like from everybody, from you, from me, from institutions, from coaches, like what kind of sport or support will it require to make sure that athletes are guaranteed the rights that they deserve? And one thing that I can like think of that's just like very minimal is just like, as you were talking, like we need to recognize the labor force changes every four years. So, you know, we need to make sure that there's a mechanism in place to make sure that college athletes are are able to see i just caught myself there college athletes are are able what happens to, when you talk to me i mean yeah you start, you start noticing huh? i'm radicalizing very much. yeah but you know there's a new labor force every four years and so i think one system of support is making sure that college athletes know what the fuck they they can do and what they're capable of and the power and you know their organizing efforts and the power in their labor like most essentially so i guess my question is just like what other support would help in this fight um from everybody yeah so i i, I think it's important for us as athletes as college athletes um to recognize first and foremost that we have value um that we have power because oftentimes uh, oftentimes we um yeah so as college athletes, it's important for us to recognize that we have power, we have value um, in our labor. I mean, just fundamentally as people, um, <laughs> but in our labor too, because oftentimes it's such an overwhelming experience that we forget that we have value. And we oftentimes feel so alone and isolated, particularly if we're struggling um, when we're playing well. And for college athletes, I think it's first most important we recognize that we we ought to stand with each other united no matter what no matter what we stand with each other one another lock arms we should never have division amongst each other as college athletes and we often feel the most powerless in the system like our coaches have all the power um but in reality we have all the power no one has a job in the athletic department without us showing up and giving our labor every day. Um, so that's important to remember for us with our power as college athletes. Um, but then as fans, um, you know, as fans, as former college athletes, as professional athletes, as supporters, coaches especially have a ton of power in this, but coaches are kind of on both sides of the fence. So it's a little weird with coaches, but as fans, we often dehumanize athletes when they play because we care more about winning or like winning that bet uh, or our team winning then uh we care about that actual person playing their product yeah the product the they care more about the product than the people and so when the what you need to realize is these are people and in college they're you know 18 to 22 year olds who are young adults and kind of you know young like kids in many ways from a legal standpoint no but like from a maturity standpoint yeah and we pour our lives into this. And so when, you know, a kid misses, like, let's take March Madness. You know, when 
Wagner, I think, from Michigan last night, misses the final bucket. I can't imagine the death threats yeah. that that kid got from yeah. that missing from missing that shot. And I'll tell you who's most upset about missing that shot. Him. Yeah. <laughs> He's the most upset about it. He's way more upset than you are. Why? He's been grinding his whole life for that opportunity. And he will have to live his entire life with that failure on his chest, on his shoulders. And as fans, we're just like, oh, I'll just DM this person. We, we went from yelling at our TVs to DMing our insults and death threats to people. And it's so awful how fans treat athletes, many, not all fans, but many fans. Um, and what we can all do most easily is just unconditionally support athletes as people. Just that. Imagine that's your kid on the, on the field. Are you going to be screaming at him for missing the shot? It, if you're even hesitating, I mean, you should look in the mirror, honestly. But the, you know, so we should support people unconditionally. Then as leaders, like advocates who are working, um, I mean, we're doing good work. And so like, I hope people start opening up, you know, their checkbooks when there's something to donate to that's worthy of donation. But for us as leaders, how do we build systems of liberation capable of, you know, countering these systems of oppression? Because that's what they are. They're systems. And the only system that exists is an oppressive one that exploits. But we deserve a system that empowers, that unites, um, and that liberates our community. Um, and so for us as leaders in this space, that's what we can do. And if there's any professional athletes listening, supporting us is by far the best thing you can do so please get in contact with us um <laughs> contact me on all socials <laughs> yeah swipe up swipe up but as, um, as a professional athlete i feel like professional athletes also grossly underestimate the power in their platform because they see other professional athletes like lebron who just has you know owns the whole planet essentially yeah. <laughs> but you know any professional athlete, if you can imagine what you were like when you were a kid, and actually this this exercise applies to all athletes as well, but college athletes too. But like, I sometimes just think about like what I was like when I was like 10 or 13, looking at a college athlete or a professional athlete and the impact that person's voice had on my life yeah. and how much they inspired me. And I think college athletes where we play it we play it cool you know we don't we don't fan out on anyone but if you know any if, if a perfect we look to professional athletes that exact same way still and i don't think professional athletes realize how far their voice carries yeah. with us as college athletes and so if college at like we are united it was surprising to see how few professional athletes actually stood and spoke out about it now, part of that's because they had their own labor issues at the time, but like the, every single professional athlete that tweeted, that supported, that went on TV to talk about, we knew, we saw what they said, I mean, we heard it. And I think for athletes, we underestimate the power that we have, both in our labor, but also in the voice that we have. Um, and so for those are the, you know, anyone should support athletes unconditionally. If yeah. you're just and you donate to the athletic department, start donating to the institution Kaya and I are working on. Um, and then professional athletes, I think, should use their platform um, and their voice to speak out on these injustices and, and to do what they can. And I know so many athletes want to, but there just hasn't been a way for them to do it. Like, how? And it's so unclear right now how. But the where people can start is stop dehumanizing athletes and sending them death threats, please. Wait, I don't know. Do you ever get death threats? I wouldn't be shocked. Like I got, are... I got more um, really disgustingly creepy men than death threats. Um, awesome, but... and that's what every woman woman deals with, especially if you're on TV. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I I can only imagine, especially with like football players and basketball players, when I mean. I, I don't even want to think about it, especially if they're black. Like I just, I, that's triggering. I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> yeah. And then you get that and then you're told, just be grateful. Yeah. <laughs> be grateful exactly. you get the gear and the opportunity. Like be grateful you get to be exploited. Like it's not yeah. that fun for folks. Um, 
Ooh, that's a lot. Um, last, last, are you last. Okay? Are we okay? Yes, I'm fine. <laughs> yes, I'm fine. Thank you for checking. Um, so what's next? Like, what is next in this fight? I know we're being super sus about like the work that we're doing, kind of behind the scenes, and I mean. I don't know the exact timing of this episode, but you know, things are being done on at least our end, but like what's next in, in this fight. So immediately the Supreme court is listening to a case um, and going to be ruling on a case as it pertains to um, educational benefits that we can receive as athletes, whether we can, whether the NCAA can limit um, the amount of educational benefits we can receive, which means like, can a school pay for my grad school? you know, after I, I finish, can I get a laptop, like educational benefits, not pay for play, but the NCAA um, is trying to use the Supreme Court as like a backdoor antitrust exemption, um, where they could solidify amateurism forever, and cap our pay forever. Um, so that's happening. Um, there's nothing people can really do about it. But <laughs> it's happening. Um, there is a slew of states that have passed um, laws pertaining to NIL, and three of them, I believe, go in effect on at least Florida and Oregon, and I think one more, go into effect on July 1st, 2021. And so as that debate discussion, you know, heats up, um, closes up upon us, you know, Congress is going to there's like six bills in Congress right now. There's going to be more introduced. Congress is going to make a decision on how this should look. And if you are passionate about this and you believe, like, let's say you believe college athletes are employees. The best thing you can do right now is to hop on Twitter and be as loud about it as possible, to be as loud and confronting with people who talk to you about this as possible, um, to educate them on like, hey, this is a racial injustice that does X, Y, Z to people. Um, and as, you know, I, I don't, we're not ready to announce it yet, but the, um, you know, you will know of the organization. If you're a fan of Kaya, you're going to know about, you know, the organization we're working on, um, the systemic solution we're working on. And honestly, donating to that, joining and having an influence in that, supporting it, uh, that's the best thing that the most common fan can do and probably the least, you know, least commitment you can do as well. Um, but those are kind of all the things on the today Supreme Court in a little bit. Um, NIL is getting passed and then Congress is going to be talking about these issues. Um, and so do what you can with your platform. And then as a uh, systemic solutions arise, hopefully not only ours, by the way, either. Um, hopefully as systemic solutions arise, you know, support them and also amplify college athlete stories. When you read a story by a college athlete that moves your heart, share it. That's, that's probably the most powerful thing anyone could do right now is to share college athlete stories because of, you know, something Kai alluded to with SIDs, um, our first amendments are restricted in many instances. And one of the people we work with, Cassidy Woods, and was cut from his team for joining We Are United, for just using his voice and standing for what he believes is right. So when college athletes do share their stories, read them and amplify them, particularly if they're women. And the first story I'll point people towards is um, A. Kaya's, of course, but <laughs> Donah Prince, who plays basketball at Oregon, has been brutally screwed over by the system um you know both in medical negligence and in financial exploitation i'm being one of the best teams in the country um so those are those are the things i think people can do this is your call to action if you are listening now this i repeat is a call to action <laughs> swipe up yeah swipe up i don't think that's a feature available but swipe up <laughs> metaphorically <laughs> Okay, so as I end the show, every guest that I have on, I'm asking them to share a story. Um, do you remember when um, about us um, to provide context for the relationship that 
me and the guests have from their perspective. Um, so quite the opposite of what I did at the beginning. Um, so this is your your time to share. I love that. Let's see. The story that most comes to mind. So we met in the summer of 2020 when I reached out to you for D one on one, which was a media company I was building at the time to share college athlete stories. And you wrote this incredibly powerful piece on um, a letter to your younger self on racial injustice. And um, that was beautiful, but we didn't really speak much after that um, for a bit. And I remember calling you the day I had quit my job. <laughs> I called you the day I quit my job um, to catch up and FaceTime. It had been a minute and we caught up and I shared with you this seed of an idea I had for, you know, my vision to dismantle the NCAA essentially. Um, and, or at least build something cool that could help athletes. And you were going to the beach in San Diego and I was in Denver. So I, I remember being jealous of that, but you, um, your energy and just your passion for it. And you shared that you were applying to law school. I was like, wow, Kai is really going to take over the world. And, um, I shared the idea with you and you just loved it and, and jumped into it right away. Um, which put pressure on me to like <laughs> do more work and, you know, do justice to you and your time and energy. And so I remember that so vividly because it really sparked me into motion and action that someone as incredible, as passionate, as strong as you um, believed in that vague esoteric vision I presented. And it really gave me the motivation and fuel to put, you know, however many hundred hours we've put into it in the last month <laughs> um, to just get us to this point because that's I mean that's really what we've we built an organization in a month um, and I'm so grateful for that moment that FaceTime that you picked up first off and then um, that you were just willing to pour uh, fuel on my fire and that's that's really I think the power of your light um, and I, I'm really grateful for it you're getting too sappy no sappiness <laughs> Kaya can't handle gratitude or appreciation, but like I live off that. That's like crap <laughs> to me. So we, you're, you're going to be growing in that regard around me, Kaya. Oh, I, I guess I will. But thank you. No, yeah, I, I still remember that. I was like on the beach. I was like, this motherfucker is calling me right as I was pulling up to the beach. And then we ended up talking for like over an hour. And I was like, oh, yeah, like this is it. So, I mean that's how you know that I was interested is that I, you know, ruined my beach day. <laughs> I think I even finished saying, thanks for letting me ruin your beach day. Yeah. I think that was the the closing for that, but no, I definitely appreciate you. Appreciate you taking the time to be on my podcast. Um, this is my esoteric vision that I've been working on for a while. Um, so thankful to have you on hopefully people were able to learn something um but yeah thanks thank you this was amazing and all i know is you need the mic <laughs> if I, if someone's got the mic pass it to kaya she needs the mic so i'm grateful that you have a mic that you're building this platform um because it's going to inspire a lot of people to lead the way that you lead and i'm grateful for that because it's going to make have it's going to have a positive impact on our society and the systems that oppress us honestly <laughs> um so thank you so much for having me i'm really excited to hear the final product of this and um i'm excited to uh see what's next I'm going to end the episode with a bit of housekeeping. Um, make sure that you subscribe, rate and review. That's how we're going to get, you know, the things that we get for the podcast. Um, follow on socials, unfiltered with Kai McCullough. Um, that's not the full thing, but unfiltered WKM. And then make sure you search merch at two twocentsports.shop. Um, and support the brand and the business. Um, and to really end it, I really just want to say fuck the NCAA. Um, I feel like that's the only appropriate way to end this episode, to be fair. I think an appropriate way is support black business and, uh, <laughs> and buy, buy merch. Buy some merch. Come on, support a black woman. Buy some merch and fuck the NCAA. <laughs>